Hello, my name is Danny Nolan and I'm the Director of Chassis Sim Technologies. And welcome to this latest episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I've got a real treat for you. What we're going to be talking about today, suspension geometry, myths and realities revisited. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without a shadow of a doubt, the most popular episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner that I've ever done, and indeed the most popular video on the Shaxim YouTube channel was a pres uh, uh, was this presentation I did would have been about 12, 13 years ago. Now, back then, I was still relatively new with this and one of the comments in there said, if you say basically one more time, I'm going to blow my effing head off. But also too, ladies and gentlemen, a couple of things have happened, have transpired since I first recorded that video. Um, firstly, um, Chassis Sim has gone on to be used in a lot more formulas. So there's been a lot more validation of the concepts that we discussed. But also too, on a more disturbing note, ladies and gentlemen, I've been seeing a lot of um, recent videos on suspension geometry, um, ladies and gentlemen, that, well, aren't quite right. And in, and in some respects are actually quite misleading. So I really wanted to take this opportunity to sort of revisit this video that I did, hopefully be able to do a better presentation that now I'm a bit more of an accomplished uh, speaker, but also too, to bring a few more bits and pieces into the presentation to make it um, a bit, uh, to refresh it and make it a bit more relevant. So let's get started. The thing that really blows me away about suspension geometry, it's probably the biggest hot button topic in either road car vehicle dynamics or race car vehicle dynamics. If you want to start a barroom brawl, ladies and gentlemen, there are a bunch of motorsport engineers and a bunch of motorsport enthusiasts and a bunch of road car enthusiasts, just walk into the bar and mention that, um, the, lateral, that the lateral location of uh, the roll center is a huge suck you in. Sit back and let the sparks fly. That, ladies and gentlemen, really illustrates what a hot button topic this is. But at the end of the day, it's always bemused me somewhat because if you think about what suspension geometry is, it boils down to three things. Suspension geometry controls the tire camber. It controls the tire toe, um, uh, uh, it controls the tire toe and orientation. But the biggest effect it has is it regulates the forces going into the sprung mass. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. That is the three things that suspension geometry does. But the reason that we sort of got got here is the thing you have to understand about car suspension geometry, it never was really designed properly from the ground up per se. It just simply happened. And what ha and, and as a consequence of that, and particularly if we take a look at the evolution of the automobile, when we take a look at the evolution of the car, if we wind the clocks back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, if a car could do 20k an hour in a corner, you were doing handstands. You were just thought, wow, this is just the most amazing thing that um, you've ever thought. And what happened is that as um, cars got lighter, as the tires got better, as they got faster, what happened was that there was quite a lag between we're doing this and the analysis lag always lagged behind, which is why you got to see so many misconceptions crop up. Okay, the thing that you've got to understand about um, suspension geometry, the first thing to understand is the concept of the instant center. And really, all the instant center is, ladies and gentlemen, is effectively uh, a glorified game of connecting the dots. So as we can see here, we've got a double wishbone arrangement, uh, we've got our upper and our lower links, and we've got the wheel center line. And effectively, what we do is that we take the front and rear wishbone links and join them to uh, their intersection point, and that is called the instant center. Now, that line that goes from the tire center line to the instant center is really significant. We're going to talk about the significance of that shortly, but effectively, as a really easy visualization, it can effectively, the instant center is that point where the tire rotates around. Not just laterally, ladies and gentlemen, but longitudinally as um, well. From this, you dictates the forces that are applied to the chassis. It dictates scrub radius. It dictates camber. So it's a so that is your fundamental building block, ladies and gentlemen, of how to understand suspension geometry. Okay, determining the instant center for various suspension types. As I said before, it's a basically this is a glorified version 
of um, connecting the dots. So for example, we've got here a McPherson strut. So what we do is we take right angle from the McPherson strut. We go down here, we take the lower uh, control arm, we take it to um, this point and that's the instant center. For a V8 supercar um, live axle rear end, exactly the same deal as it was for the double wishbone. We've got the upper control arm, the lower control arm, we go to our intersection point, that's the instant center. It's as simple as that, ladies and gentlemen, and don't overcomplicate it. The worst thing you can do with this stuff is to massively overcomplicate it. Now, there are a few things that um, we can determine from where the instant center is, uh, from uh, where the instant center is. Okay, first things first, the shorter the instant center or the shorter that length from the tire to the instant center, and that is great for camber recovery. So for example, if you're dealing with something like a NASCAR, for instance, where you're on a super speedway, you're dealing with small def small body movements, small deflections, having a smaller instant center actually plays to your advantage because you can do some really clever things in terms of camber recovery and camber control. However, if you're dealing with something like a competitive uh, Baja buggy, you've got a lot of power, but you're running on sand, you don't have a lot of grip, you actually want that instant, the location between the instant center and the tire to be very, very long because what that does is as you go up and uh, as you go up and down, that that's really good for minimizing camber variation. However, it's absolutely crap when you start to roll. So again, what you'll do in suspension geometry design will always be this dance between those two um, uh, uh, between um, those two competing um, uh, require uh, uh, two competing. Um, uh, requirements. Um, a quick note on active systems. If you are dealing with an active system where you are, uh, uh, where all you have to worry about is making sure that tires are nicely controlled and the body is nicely controlled, in some respects that will impact on your suspension design. You can go for a longer instant center. But here's the thing: what will work for an active car may not uh, is not going to necessarily work for a passive car and I'll, and a lot of that comes down to that dance you play between the location between the instant center and where the tire center line is now the other thing that suspension geometry does is it regulates bump steer now this is probably the most i wouldn't say the most straightforward of it but probably the least controversial of it effectively all bump steer ladies and gentlemen is dictated by this equation here that is in any linkage in the suspension system the length has to remain constant um other uh, or now you can sort of incorporate this with any sort of uh, of um, uh, compliance that you get into the system but a pretty good place to start is when you're at, when you're doing an analysis on bump steer to treat all of the suspension members as basically fixed lengths now the really really good thing about this is that something like this is very very easy to calculate using cad and using suspension geometry pro programs like susprog it's this stuff, particularly the, the geometry programs like Susprog, they do this very, very well. Uh, now, one thing to note about doing this in CAD, while CAD is a fantastic tool, I mean, tools like AutoCAD, SolidWorks, they do a very, very good job. The thing to note where you can sometimes be sucked down the garden path is the way they calculate their distance algorithms, because particularly when you've got complicated 3D geometry, what will often happen is that as the geometry gets a little bit weird and funky, if there's any error in terms of resolving um, this because it's a square root equation, this is where things can sometimes just get a little bit dicey, which is why one of the things I always say, it's all well and good doing this in CAD and suspension geometry, but always double check by, me uh, by measuring the car up and measuring it um, in the workshop. Now, rough rule of thumb here, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that when you are designing steer linkages, you want to get them as parallel and as close to the upper top arms um, at the front and the rear as uh, as you can. That just minimizes any bump steer. Now, sometimes a little bit of bump steer can sometimes play to your advantage. However, when you're starting off, keep it simple. Try and minimize it as much as you can. You're never gonna eliminate it, but you wanna try and minimize it as much as you can. The other thing too that I also want to say is that I presented a video, would have been a couple of years ago, about Ackerman and I sort of left it to the reader, uh, to the viewer, to 
fill in the numbers. Now, one thing that I'm going I, I one point that I want to raise with both camber control and bump steer. These are very important setup parameters, but when it comes to suspension geometry, if we take a look at the structure of the tire, if we take a look at particular tire sensitivity to slip angle, we take a look at tire sensitivity to camber angle, while they certainly play their part, they are primarily second order effects. What truly draw uh, the big impact of suspension geometry is how forces get transmitted into the sprung and the unsprung masses. Which leads me to the discussion of um, the kinematic roll center. Now, if you take a look at most textbooks on suspension geometry, what they will do is they will take the left-hand side and the right-hand side. They will take the links. They will have a look at the instant center for the left-hand side, instant center for the right-hand side. Um, and they will draw the line from the center line of the right-hand tire, the center line of the left-hand tire. And voila, that is your, uh, uh, and voila, that is your roll center. That is where the car's going to roll about. It's also been um, uh, presented that that is where the force is applied. But here is the critical, critical question of vehicle um, uh, dynamics. And as we're about to see, ladies and gentlemen, this is a big suck you in. Is this really what happens? To understand this, we've got to do a proof. And what I mean by a proof is that we do a free body diagram analysis of our sprung, of our unsprung mass, and the sprung mass. Now, when we go through, now to simplify the analysis, to make sure the maps are simple, what we're going to do is that we're going to assume the, we're going to assume very, very simple geometries for where um, uh, the top arm and the lower arms are located. So in this case, a tire radius and half a tire radius. And what we're going to do here is assume that the uh, lower control arm is parallel to the ground and we're using a simple 2D visualization. Now, we're not doing this to, to fudge the results, ladies and gentlemen. We're doing this to keep things simple because part of the thing of a mathematical proof is that what you want to do is you start on an assertion then you take a look at one particular analysis to show this is where the numbers are going to um, turn out at. And then you take another bit of the analysis to show, uh, uh, come at it from a different point of the compass to see where you need to be. And that's pretty much the thing of how you, uh, that's pretty much of how you do a mathematical, uh, uh, how, how you do a mathematical proof. Now, when we go through and we do the numbers, it is actually, there's some very, very interesting things are found about the roll center. Uh, uh, some very interesting things are found about the roll center. We find that the roll center is at this point when you go through and do the force analysis. But more importantly, when you go through and do the geometry, the roll center is in exactly the same point. Now, I first did this proof about 24 years ago, and I reproduced this proof. Um, in my book, The Dynamics of the Race Car. That's chapter three, The Dynamics of the Race Car. Now, the mistake I made when I did this 24 years ago was that I sucked in the Kool-Aid of assuming that all the forces would be that um, lo location of both the vertical and the horizontal roll center. And so what I did with Chassis Sam, it would have been circa 1996 through to about 2007, I figured, okay, well, that's it. That's got to apply for the horizontal location of the roll center as well. And and while Chassis Sim was getting some good results, there was, from time to time, you had some really weird stuff crop up. And I was just scratching my head, going, hang on, something's not quite right here. And then um, I found an article done by the late Bill Mitchell. Now, Bill was very, very famous in uh, race car vehicle dynamic circles in the 90s and the early 2000s and was the father of Wingeo. And um, he came up with a paper on force application points. And when I read that, in would have been in 2008, it was basically this big, huge forward slapping moment. And ladies and gentlemen, the thing that actually drives roll in the car, it's not the vertical and horizontal location of the roll center it's the force application point and what i've done here ladies and gentlemen uh, done here ladies and gentlemen is i've shown it for the asymmetric case so what we've got here is we've got a right hand side which is um our force application uh, which is our force application point here and we've got the left hand side which is our force application point here ladies and gentlemen this is the thing that drives suspension geometry behavior 
this is the thing that actually genuinely ro uh, uh, that actually genuinely rolls the car and to do and uh, and basically to find this all we've got to do is we know where the center of gravity is we link the suspend uh, we find out where the instant center is we connect the line from the tire under the instant center and that moment arm is that moment arm of that line from the tire to the instant center under the center of gravity it is that moment arm ladies and gentlemen this is the thing that truly drives your suspension geometry behavior it it drives your forces and moments into the sprung mass from this you get your jacking forces as well as your rolling moments it is also the forces that are applied to the unsprung mass that ladies and gentlemen in a nutshell is what drives suspension geometry um, behavior and particularly what i do in um, uh, chapter three of my book the dynamics of the race car is about three quarters of that um, chapter is all the proofs for this now i'm not going to go through and regenerate those proofs for you because quite frankly we'd be here for about three to four hours um rather i would refer you um to that not because it's in my financial interest for you to do so but when you read a mathematical proof it's very very important to go through to read the minute um, uh, detail to make sure that you have a true comprehension uh, a true comprehension of it so i'll leave you with this so i'll leave you with that now the other big suck you in ladies and gentlemen uh, uh, now the other thing before we get on to uh how uh, before we get on to anti-dive and anti-squat right now we've presented the case where we've done a very very simple 2d visualization so we've just assumed everything is parallel we've assumed we've visualized it in 2d so but as we all know suspension linkages aren't simply two-dimensional members they happen in three uh, they happen in three dimensions so how do we deal with this it's actually a hell of a lot easier than you think all we've got to do is that we take a look so for example with this double a arm with this double wishbone arrangement we take a look at the top a arm wishbone we take a look at that plane and we take the vertical plane of the tire or the x head plane of the tire along the wheel center line that is your 2d arm at the top that is your 2d arm at the bottom and it is from that, ladies and gentlemen, that we can go back and do our visualization of where the force application points are going to be. It's as simple as that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the other great suck you in of um, suspension geometry is anti-dive and anti-squat. And in particular, make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, anti-dive and anti-squat the or the way that suspension geometry linkages are transmitted into the chassis longitudinally or along um, the x-axis is without a shadow of a doubt ladies and gentlemen the worst explained concept of all of road car or race car vehicle dynamics to be quite honest ladies and gentlemen um we've made an absolute dog's porridge of it but here's the thing and here's the, here's the big thing and here's the big suck you in the force application points that we discussed with um, uh, with how we do lateral um, uh, force transfer into the chassis is exactly the same as longitudinal um, uh, as its longitudinal um, uh, dynamics. Precisely, uh, it, it, the parallels are quite striking. And in particular, when you start thinking about anti dive and anti squat being force based as opposed to a lot of the old traditional uh, uh, traditional measures a lot of stuff becomes incredibly clear now the way that we define a force-based roll center is we take a look at the longitudinal moment or on the y-axis which is your lateral forces cg height minus the pitch center your percent andy is 100 times the pitch center divided by the cg height and um, the force transmitted into the unsprung mass and your jacking force is going to be the longitudinal force times pitch center divided by the moment arm ladies and gentlemen digest that equation because i can tell you right now that will make your life particularly with regards to understanding what your longitudinal suspension geometry is doing it will make your life infinitely easier and the analysis behind this is pretty much identical to this all that we're doing is that we're turning this on its head and looking at it in the longitudinal case now going back here uh, now uh, uh, going uh, uh, now um, uh, now going back here 
Um, the pitch center, just to really ram home that point, the pitch center rams is that point where the longitudinal forces are applied to the sprung mass. That's it. That's all. If you if that is all that you take away from this video, particularly with regards to longitudinal dynamics, it's going to make your life a hell of a lot easier. So how do we find this? Okay, so when the torque is applied at the axle, so if we're dealing with um, outbound, uh, if we're dealing with um, dismounted brakes um, at the wheel, we're dealing, and under acceleration, say we're dealing with a live axle car, all you've got to do is that you go through and you connect, the, uh, is that you go through and you connect the dots. That's your pitch center. And you do it straight under, um, the, uh, you do it um, straight under the CG line. That's it. That's as simple as that. So what happens now if you've got, say, inboard mounted brakes or if you've got an independent rear end and you're applying acceleration? Well, if you're doing that, all that you do is you go through exactly the same process with the linkages and drop it by a tire radius. That's it. That is it. That is your force application point in um, when the torque is applied at the chassis as opposed to the axle. That's all there is to it. If you can understand that, ladies and gentlemen, in particular, understand that for that concept of the force application point, you are now in a very, very much better place. And the and a really good way of visualizing this is a key takeaway is that when we visualize the forces that are being acted on the car, so we can visualize it with this very, very simple diagram. So we've got um, our longitudinal, uh, we've got our lateral and longitudinal forces being applied at the contact patch. So laterally, these are our force application points. Laterally, um, front and rear, and these are our force application points longitudinally. If you can understand that, ladies, uh, if you can understand that, ladies and gentlemen, you are now in a really, really, really good place because now you can that allows you to really nail down what's going on in terms of the forces that are rolling the car the jacking forces that are being applied at the chassis and are uh, and are being applied at the uh, at the sprung mass and make no mistake ladies and gentlemen um with the dynamics of the race car i uh, i took an awful awful lot of effort to make sure that those proofs were in place that you could really see where all of this comes from now I realize that quite a few of you listening to this video are going to be going, well, hang on, this guy's uh, uh, this uh, uh, um, this guy uh, uh, this guy is just um, uh, this uh, this guy's completely full of it because he's just gone and um, uh, stumped his nose for God knows um, how many uh, for God knows um, uh, um, how many conventions have been around for years. Well, ladies and gentlemen, everything that I've just outlined to you here, and I want to close on this note is the mathematics behind chassis sim. And without that, correlation like this would be impossible. So this is V8 supercar correlation. So we're dealing with some very, very big longitudinal forces, both in braking and in acceleration. And also too, because it's a big car, we're dealing with very, very big long, uh, lateral forces as, uh, as well. I mean, a V8 supercar weighs, uh, uh, well, this particular supercar weighs, uh, uh, weighed in at 1500 kilos. So consequently, if everything that we've just discussed about force application points, both laterally and longitudinally, did not apply, the correlation that you are seeing here, actual as colored, simulated as black, just simply would not be possible. So I really want to, uh, 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 but um, I really want to leave you on that thought. But look, don't take my word for it. What I'd encourage you all to do is, for those of you who have got the dynamics of the race card, read chapter three. For those of you who um, don't have the book yet, um, uh, yeah, by all means, go it. Go through, digest chapter three, and see for you uh, and see for yourself just how straightforward it is. And we'll catch you in the next episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner.